And we are live. Um, this is your Career Mastery podcast we have on Lydia Infante. She is the Senior SEO Manager at Sanity.io. It is a headless CMS co company. And uh, yeah, we're very excited to have her on. Lydia has been very busy. Um, she <laughs> first gave a speech at SEO Exclusive. And then this week she got um, on stage again at MozCon. So we are so excited to be scheduled in Lydia's busy calendar. So thank you so much, Lydia, for having um, for coming on our podcast and uh, chatting a little bit to us today about the industry. Um, so yeah, Lydia, to kick things off, I think let's go with a beginning off story uh, sort of question. How did you get into SEO? Can you tell us a little bit about the journey um, and how you discovered SEO maybe? Sure. Um, so it was, I don't know really where to start. I, I wasn't meant to be a marketer at all to begin with. I, I studied psychology and I was in uni and I was really set to become like either a neuroscience researcher or like wow. the best therapist ever, ever, ever. Um, <laughs> and I was actually working in a project for the, um, Barcelona Education Council, uh, working with like underprivileged kids, um, just kind of like making a bit of a safe space after school for them to like do their homework with me and get a little bit of support and making sure that they were, you know, like wearing clean clothes, showered, and if not, like trying to reach out to their families to provide support. Um, mm. But that job ended in the summer, right? Like there was no, no school in the summer. There was a big break. So I was actually looking for like a summer job, like a bartender job or a, literally whatever, like just a summer job little summer job um so i went to my favorite uh bar which was an irish pub in barcelona and i wanted to leave my cv there but it was closed but it was meant to be open so i was like annoyed and i like put my like crumbled up my cv into a wall and threw it um into a window at the bar and they called me up for an interview and i was like oh okay <laughs> and it was like my flattened cv with all the creases <laughs> And they wanted me to work in events and PR for them. Um, wow. The head of marketing there was um, the daughter of a marketing professional or marketing professor that was that came from a psychology background. So she decided that because I was studying psychology, obviously it would be perfect for her marketing department. And I was like, yeah, that sounds actually fun. I'll do it. I got into marketing that way, working in an Irish pub in Barcelona um, doing events and brand partnerships and all that stuff. Um, but then mm. that pub closed because we got too many fines from being too loud. Um, <laughs> Typical Irish Sounds like sense. they were doing the right thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, the neighbors were not happy with us. So, um, yeah, we had to close the main pub for like a really long time. So it meant that I was out of a job during like a super big unemployment crisis in Spain. Um, and I was mm. looking for a job. I found a job in PPC, doing international um, Google Ads for a clothing personalization company. And I did that for two years and a half. And I was sitting, you know, next to the head of web and the SEO that were working on the site. Um, because I had like a lot of free time after work and uni, I would, I started a feminist magazine with a bunch of friends of mine. Um, and initially, we got all of our traction on social media. But mind you, this was 20, 2015. So oh, wow. Facebook was like cutting traffic and reach pretty heavily. Um, we had to pivot. And we had this little um, this little widget on our WordPress dashboard where I could see what people were searching for when they reached our site. And I was like, oh, like these are interesting questions. Why don't we just like answer them and do a really good job answering them? Um, and that's how I got into SEO. I was combining, you know, like working on to, in that magazine with the uh, knowledge that I was kind of absorbing uh, by being sitting next to the uh, web and SEO team at my day job. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it started going really, really big. So we, we were betting on brand very heavily. We had a very strong brand voice and we earned like 35,000 backlinks without ever trying from like... Mm -hmm dot um like educational um websites government websites um just by putting out quality resources 
and being quite like opinionated on social. And yeah, I pivoted our traffic source to SEO. We it was collaborative, so we had like an open um, form. Well, not a form. Like you would sign up, make your user, and um, send a proposal for content. So I had to like edit the content there. We had tons of volume, which allowed us to actually like drive real traffic from SEO. That's right. um, quite interesting um, because we we recently had. Um, a guest as well, JP Bacho. He also came from a psychology background. And it's so interesting to see how you guys with the psychology backgrounds, like sort of discover the cut, uh, the consumer journey and the customer journey. Um, but yeah, sorry, Darius, you, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, because we have a client in Australia that is always keen to get UK people to travel across because the SEO in Australia is six months to a year behind what it is in the UK. I was just wondering, whenever you were obviously working in SEO in Spain and Barcelona, whenever you came to the UK market, did you notice a jump there or was it pretty much the same? No, it's it was definitely a big, big jump. Um, what I like to say is that Google speaks um, two languages. Like it speaks HTML, markup, a little bit of JavaScript, like pretty, pretty decent JavaScript to be fair right now, um, and English. And then it's starting to learn... Um, the other languages, but it's slower than English, you know, like it's trying to process natural language the same way that a human would, but it's doing a much better job with English than with other languages. So weird little hacks that worked a million years ago still work in some of the international markets. Um, so I feel like there can be a bit of a big drop in quality and depending on the market that you're working on. And I did notice that I actually felt like I had a bit of an edge over my competitors when I was working in SaaS in Spain because I was working for a British company. So I felt like I had a lot of the British how-tos and the freedom to connect, uh, tap onto the British, uh, well, the English-speaking knowledge networks to actually do my job a lot better um, in Spain. And I felt like it gave me a massive edge, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And Lydia, uh, obviously, before you came on, I was on your LinkedIn profile and it said that you love to travel solo. So it's more of a two part question. So first of all, where all have you traveled to? And second of all, has it ever affected your work with an SEO while traveling? Um, I think one of the wildest trips that I've done is I went to India um, kind of on my own. Um, I had a friend in uh, the north of India in a city called Chandigarh. And I went there uh, for a wedding that I was like not invited to. She was like the wedding designer for the thing. And she just kind of like sneaked me in. It was really, really fun. <laughs> um, but then, and I don't want to tell like the full story because it will take us the whole podcast. But I nearly got <laughs> murdered like immediately oh, like the funny. next day. <laughs> And it was absolutely <laughs> wild. And then at some point, like, she came with me to New Delhi. And then we went to Agra to see the Taj Mahal. Uh, then we drove to Jaipur. And she kind of, like, abandoned me in Jai Jaipur. and was like, bye. You did the rest of your trip on your own. I'm going to go hang out with my boyfriend in a different <laughs> state. And I was like, yeah, okay. It's not like I'm miles away from my home or anything. Um, and I also found that... Because we, we were driven, like, places in, like, like a guy in a car would just, like, show up and take us places. She would arrange it. And she would call them uncle. So she'd be like, oh, my uncle so-and-so is coming. And I was like, oh, great. It's all in the family. Um, turns out uncle is just a respectful way to say, like, I don't know. It's like a friendly way or a respectful way to talk to other mm -hmm. people. And they were not actually <laughs> related and she was, like, really worried that I stayed in the car with her uncle. I was like, what do you mean? It's just family. And she's like, no, it's a stranger. Don't be in the car alone with a stranger. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that was pretty pretty wild. I survived in the event only just. Um, it That's has funny. not affected my work in SEO. I would say I really love traveling when I'm speaking. And I absolutely adore the enrichment of minds that happen uh, when you put together people who work in Australia, people who work in the US, the UK, and international markets, and we just hang out uh, in a big group of nerds with a beer or two, 
uh, talking about what works in our markets and what doesn't. Or for example, I went to I went to the US. Yeah, I was like at, at Moscow last week, um, and I googled myself as you do, and I had a knowledge panel in the US, and I was like, "Fuck yeah, I'm somebody. Google knows me." <laughs> <laughs> so I would Absolutely. say that. <laughs> yeah, I t- I have like thirty screenshots of it because immediately below my name they're like people also search for Elena and I'm like Elena, you're comparing me to Elena. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> has has um uh managing an SEO team uh how has that been when you I guess do you work fully remotely or hybrid or what's your sort of setup and I guess when you're traveling do you have like a sort of a different system or a dynamic shift um are there any tips i guess um that you could give to any other seo managers that are looking to manage a seo team remotely or hybrid wise currently uh the only team that i manage is a team of freelance writers they're okay and they're fully onboarded they're extremely good at their jobs like extremely um there's one of them that literally writes the briefs on his own and i'm like what a blessed human being you are <laughs> Um, his name is Eric. Shout out because he's fantastic. Um, so they they can usually just run with it, and I can literally be away for a week, um, working on networking, getting the word out about our product, um, and focus on delivering a really good talk and having like little conversations around headless SEO, because um, awesome. they can literally just fly on their own. Mm. Yeah. And then speaking of working for Sanity at the minute. Um, obviously, before that, you were working with probably one of the biggest agencies, definitely in the UK, if not probably in the world right now, Rise at Seven. How was that transition going from big agency life down to obviously sort of smaller in-house team? Oh, um, that's a very good question. I would say the biggest transition between being <laughs> in... <laughs> Good job there. <laughs> I would say the biggest transition is how much um, when you move in house, you have to own your own initiatives um, and how much you cannot just upload responsibility of things not happening, right? So if tickets are not being prioritized, it's not like your own um, agency side where you have obstacles to reach the internal stakeholders within your client you can actually like knock on their doors, talk to them and be like, hey, what's up? Let's let's fix this. Um, you have to invest a lot more in stakeholder relationship, um, not just client relationships. And it's a lot more long-term and um, you're not swapping in between clients and industries. So it becomes a little bit more of a slow thinking while doing process. Um, There is a framework by Aleda on um, how to onboard onto new clients that talks about um, taking parallel streams of executing on low-hanging fruit while working on, you know, big pieces of SEO work just to make sure that um, your clients are happy while you get all your, like, ducks in a row to be able to make the work work. Um, What I have found in-house is that you can create a bit of a, content machine or a content system, if that is your main focus, um, get that working. And that becomes a bit of a doing part of your work. Um, While in parallel, you can do a bit more of a thinking part of your work where you consider um, what would I be happy five years, like in five years, what would I be happy that I did five years from now? What is the project that did not give returns immediately, but I believe was going to give returns, very serious returns in the long term. You can also think about content strategy and repurposing um, and study what your users are looking for and want a lot more. So I don't know. I I really like the in-house work for that, but I used to love the um, agency work. I used to have my own team and a very broad set of clients, which meant that I was like up to date on many different industries, many different types of search and client management skills and project management skills. So so would you ever consider going back to the agency side or are you? I would actually. Stick in, um, in no, no, I definitely would. If 
if somebody, like if in a few years there is a salary in an agency that's actually appealing to somebody that's been quite senior in house, right? Um, mm -hmm. I would love to be in a role where you establish like best practice and create like workloads and documentations for your agency um, team. I found that I got to do a little bit of that um, at Ryzen 7 and I found it super interesting. Like for example, um, I've got this SEO gap analysis framework that I got to teach the whole agency at some point um, and create a little bit of like a set of templates for them to use to accelerate the work that they were doing with clients. Because at the end of the day, um, agency work is a lot of a uh, selling time of your team uh, for a markup that allows you to mm -hmm. take in risk and actually bring in clients and scale. Um, but that means that you can only grow by bringing in more people. Now there's agencies that are trying to do it a little bit different and subvert the typical work structure where you're, um, I don't know, I guess um, an example would be Snippet Digital or Snippet Consultant um, that's being run by the same people as Keyword Insights. They try to use, to leverage a lot of AI to actually be able to do the work of a 20 people agency with just like three people. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And, and Lydia, um, when you left Rise at 7 to go to Sanity to be an SEO manager, was there many barriers to entry to becoming an SEO manager compared to previous roles? Um, not really. I was very, um, like, I was very able to grow when I was at Rise at 7. Um, I came in uh, at a time in the agency where you heard yes a lot more than you heard no. Um, and if I fancied like taking on this client. Oh, this client's really interesting. I'd like to have them. It would be like, yes, have them. Lead the account if you want to. I'd be like, yeah, I'll lead the account. Um, <laughs> I've come up with a framework. Can I do this framework and teach it to everybody? Yeah, go ahead, do the framework. We believe in you. We trust you. That's awesome. Yeah, so I felt like I had a lot of career growth there. Um, but I actually came into Rise at 7 as a... Uh, digital strategist, senior digital strategist, maybe, I can't remember. Um, and then I ended up like um, lead, which was above strategist, uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. strategist became manager, and then I became a lead, which was a step above uh, manager, eventually a senior lead. Um, mm -hmm. So I felt like there was a lot of space for me to grow there. It, I did not find that there were many barrier, barriers of entry there. But um, I was already coming from a SaaS company, which meant that I already had to do a lot of stakeholder management and project management. Um, so I had a lot of the in-house skills already. Awesome. Good question. Um, was that career progression, was that more so from, I think, the company side where you were clear about where you were headed or were you sort of like as you were growing, the positions sort of evolved? Um, I was like kind of tasked with a bunch of very, very different clients. Uh, sorry, okay. very, very difficult clients. Not difficult as in they were personally difficult, but like the work was really complicated or it was like really broad. And uh, at first I was like, oh yeah, that's perfectly normal agency thing to do. Uh, spoiler alert, it was not, I was, it was actually quite a unique position to be in. Um, mm. So I felt like I was really, really trusted. And then at some point I looked back at all of the work that I had done and I said, guys, this was really good. I deserve a promotion. So I asked for a promotion. I was promoted. And then they were like, oh, by the way, you know how we promoted you? Uh, why don't you, you take a further step forward and lead a team of all of our international offering, the fine prices, get clients, wow. and do absolutely everything to start up this team, hire, <laughs> onboard, manage. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Um, sure, it's crazy. And I just had to pick up the skills as I went. I was, I had a lot of luck. I had really good mentors. I got to work with mm -hmm. Luke Cope and Stephen Kenwright really closely. And they were actually mm -hmm. fantastic, like top tier people. Um, and I was like, because I, I always was of the fake it until you make it mentality. And I was like pretty convinced that I was still in the faking stage, not in the making stage. 
<laughs> so I was reading books obsessively, um, learning how to manage people. And, you know, I was like, I had like an audiobook always on because with an audiobook, I could learn in the shower. I could learn while I cooked. I could learn while I was falling asleep, you know? So like all of my waking time that wasn't working time was like audiobook in my ears about leadership, about negotiation. And actually for people who are trying to break into more of a managerial position, I have some books that I could recommend. Um, the No Bullshit Leadership Manifesto is very good. Um, and then there's this negotiating book uh, called Never Split the Difference. Very, very, very good book. I would also recommend Surrounded by Idiots to understand <laughs> how to do stakeholder You're on the management. podcast today. <laughs> what, sorry? Oh, no, don't be silly. We've got Darius. <laughs> Darius is great. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> um, um, just Lydia, before, sorry, can... just before. Uh, just oh, before sorry, we uh, move on, uh, just to build off of the, the learning uh, part that you were, when you were in that phase of reading a lot of books and audiobooks, was there a big bottleneck that you were, um, I think you realized for yourself? Like, were you sort of struggling more with the soft skills or the people skills or the technical skills? Like, was there a prominent bottleneck that you realized during this process? And I guess, how did you de further develop that or better that? Yeah, so I felt like technical skills, I'm like, I find it really easy to pick up. Anything that's hard skills, I find it quite easy to pick up. It's more of the soft skills that I struggle with. So I am obsessed with getting shit done. Like, I'm like, fast, 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 do, do, do. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Like, at least we know what doesn't work. So we can refocus and pivot. I'm like, quite confident and quick when we're doing things. Now, that doesn't really work when you have to wait for others. Um, and being like so obsessed with getting stuff done, being so fast can be very good in some environments, but it can completely work against you in other environments. Um, so that's the thing that, I, that I've had to struggle with the most and I still struggle with it. The patience of like, it's fine. The content piece can wait a week. Let's make sure that X stakeholder is happy before we publish because that's that matters more for success than a little bit of traffic <laughs> but like i literally have a post-it in here that says like um speed is not always your friend um so i would say that yeah. that's the bit that i struggle with the most being able to take a step back and understand that not everybody wants to like go 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 and mm -hmm. some people are going to feel actually quite mm -hmm. I don't want to say threatened. It's not the right word. It would be like I'm stepping on their toes or like that, that mm -hmm. they're being trampled. So mm -hmm. not trampling people would be my, um, my main challenge at the moment. Okay, awesome. Perfect. Okay. And Lydia, um, you've obviously been quite senior roles at like sort of three companies now. You mentioned with Rise at Seven that you got the chance to grow out your own team and obviously be involved in the, the hiring process. What would be your sort of ideal team structure when building out an SEO team and how tricky did you find sort of hiring in the market? That's a very good question. Um, I think the Sorry. ideal structure, congrats, you're doing amazing. <laughs> um, the ideal structure would depend a lot on exactly what the company is trying to achieve and where they are. Um, currently, I would say I'm working in a team where there is a very, very strong technical and coding and data analysis person in my team uh, that I work with. Then there's me, uh, I'm just like, where are the gaps? How can we plug them fast? Let's go. Um, and then I have a team of writers that are freelance writers. And internally, I have some technical reviewers that also like help me push things out. I am finding that in this moment that we're living in, in search, a content team needs to have these desi design resources. So whatever I do, I would onboard a designer, um, either in-house or a freelance designer to be able to like make illustrations ad hoc that enhance the content, not just decorate the content. Um, somebody that's able to work with video as well. Like uh, there are some AI tools right now that are 
making it really easy. But yeah, I would definitely want to work with somebody who's doing design. Somebody that I would be like, when I imagine the team that I would be in, I would put myself in a strategic leadership position where I may be more hands-on with content strategy um, and collaborate with a technical specialist on technical strategy. Um, measuring exactly what your goals are is a lot easier in e-commerce, but when you're working in SaaS with very long uh, buying cycles, it's a little bit harder. So maybe I wouldn't have them in the SEO team, but I would collaborate very strongly with the data team. Um, I would collaborate very strongly as well with the ads team. And I would definitely try to either have a dotted line to somebody who does Haro led link building for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then make sure that I have either some outreach resources for thought leadership pieces or um, hire freelance services for some le thought leadership pieces to outreach them. And there's also like some agencies that are doing brilliant work. Work um, is a little bit more inno innovative, innovative mm -hmm. um, in the space of link building. I would, for example, love to work with Stacey McNaught. Um, I actually got some quotes from her um, last year and we couldn't make it work because my team couldn't, um, not because of her, but it's still stuck in my mind, all her proposals and strategy ideas. I would love to like work with other types of link building as well. Brilliant, brilliant, perfect. And Lydia, I'm just taking a, a step away from the, um, just for a post that you made about maximizing your uh, social media impact. It's huge for our company and I'm sure it's huge for most viewers in this, you know, optimizing your social media. Can you just expand on what you meant by sort of maximizing your social media impact, what you can do to sort of have a better presence? Yeah. Um... Obviously, I'm not a social media expert, even though I'm trying to, or I have kind of succeeded at building a brand on social media. Um, I think I would recommend that you maintain an authentic voice and build authentic relationships. I don't believe in like the way that some people network is a lot around using people to grow. I'm more of a let's connect one-on-one -on -one as genuine human beings and mm -hmm. let's see like what happens and mm -hmm. let's just primarily have fun creating together if that's what's going to mm -hmm. happen right so build authentic relationships look at people as people not brand assets um and have an authentic voice that actually reflects who you are um because if you if you try to pretend to be like a corporate professional you're just gonna sound <laughs> like everyone else right yeah. you're never gonna see me do like this is how i 10x my traffic in 10 days with zero dollars <laughs> like that's stupid i don't make threats like that <laughs> or like i fired all of my staff and hired them in filipinas and now i make three times more because i exploit others like absolutely not just be a real human being with real human opinions and you know, like I fuck up 30 times a day, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I like talking about it or I like talking about how absolutely beautiful my cat is or what a massive, <laughs> adorable dork my husband is, right? Mm -hmm. Be real, be human and don't be afraid to show up as yourself because there is nobody else like you and it's super cliche, but but it's true. And definitely be helpful. I actually went... I don't want to name drop because he would probably sue me, but I went on a date <laughs> with like a Silicon Valley guy um, and I asked him like, oh, what's the best advice you've ever received? I was in a phase where I was asking this to everybody, but I was just trying to be a little bit of a, I don't know. I asked this on dates. Okay. I used to ask this on dates and everyone would be like, oh, that's such an insightful question. Anyway, <laughs> this guy, Silicon Valley I'll guy, who I cannot name, <laughs> yeah, I was like... <laughs> what's the best advice you've ever received? And he said, always do other people's favors. And I have this little notebook where I write down all my advice. I actually put it uh, out on a blog post last year when it was actually 10 years that I had been in the marketing industry. Um, I can share it in the comments if you like. And yeah, always do other people's favors. Just by going out and being helpful, you'll make so many more connections and it feels just so good. 
when somebody mm -hmm. says, I applied that framework of yours and it actually got me promoted or it got me through a very difficult time in my career or seeing your struggles, seeing you publicly speak of your struggles uh, just makes me feel more at ease about my own. Mm. Literally just be, just be a human being, just be a person, not a brand. Mm. I, uh, I actually saw a post, I think it was last week or the week before where um, you um, where LinkedIn is now promoting more personal stories and stuff like that, which I thought was so funny because and like it's this common thread that keeps coming up um, through all social media, I guess. It's like, you know, just be it more of a human, show your more human side. So it's quite interesting. Um, I think I want to ask one more question, if that's okay, before we wrap things up. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you are rushing off on your Friday <laughs> evening. No, um, I'm perfectly uh, fine if you want to run a little over. Okay. Um, awesome. Um, how important is company culture? How do you nurture it? And um, yeah, is um, are there a few ways that you manage it within the week or months, I guess, especially as a, um, I guess, in when you are remote working or hybrid working? Yeah. Um, that's also very insightful, very interesting question. I would say it's, ne one, it's never, <laughs> yay, it's been, never been within my... Um, responsibilities to actually nurture company culture except for when I was managing a team directly um, but what I have found is that company culture is going to evolve and that's not always necessarily a bad thing you know lots mm -hmm. of people are going to look back and say oh I miss our culture from before but we are resistant to change unless the culture has gotten objectively worse um, I would say let it evolve and let's evolve together as we evolve as a company because the needs of the company are going to evolve as well. Um, and as you scale an agency, the same things that you were doing when you were 10 people are not going to work when you're 100 people. Mm -hmm. And I actually saw some advice. I can't remember what agency was putting this out. Um, I believe it was Bottled Imagination uh, that we're talking about just asking their staff what they like as benefits instead of assuming and having benefits that nobody uses or nobody likes. Um, maybe being mm. a little flexible with how you take in benefits. I saw that there are some companies that allow you, like allow you a point system and you decide to spend your points on maybe like health insurance and the gym or a therapist or like there's, there's a very different set of things. Um, but yeah, embrace the change when it happens. Now, if the change is negative, there are some people that can be negative and toxic for the company. And these people, as much as it hurts us personally to like let go somebody, there's some people that need to be let go for the sake of the rest of your team, right? It's not an act of, I don't know, it's not an act of hate or selfishness. You're actually protecting other people by letting go of yeah. more toxic people. And definitely people in leadership positions are can be like very overwhelmed with work and delegate hiring to other people. If you're not extremely careful with, with who you delegate hiring to and who they delegate hiring to, you might end up hiring, like having a person in, char in charge of hiring that consistently yeah. hires bros. And you don't mm. want a company made of bros because that's going to be a train wreck. That's why you got to come to SEO for hire. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, the team are itching to ask uh, to round off with um, the latest updates on uh, MozCon. So I know we uh, spoke a little bit about it before the call, but um, how was your experience? How was the talk? And uh, yeah, could you give us a little bit of, uh, I guess, breakdown on that? Um, yeah, it was incredible. I When the MozCon team reached out and invited me to speak for a second year in a row, I was like, wait, me? You mean me? Like, did you email <laughs> the wrong person? Um, <laughs> I was so honored. It's such an incredible lineup. The speakers were just insanely good. Um, and I remember quite a few of the talks made a huge impact in me and the way that I think about it. I literally cannot wait until they're available for us to like rewatch online because awesome. there were some incredible talks. So some of the ones that I liked the most were um, Miracle in a Mentis talk. 
was insane. Uh, you actually would love um, Crystal Carter's talk on video yeah. SEO because oh. all of this beautiful content that you're making needs to be <laughs> and packaged in very nice ways. Um, and those two made a huge impact. And then we also had two talks. One of them was like very reassuring and the other one was like completely panic inducing. Um, we had uh, Ross, um, who talked about content distribution and how to leverage AI tools. And actually at the very end of the talk, he put on a video on screen that was completely AI generated of him speaking to us. And it was not, it was never him. He never said those things. It was just a AI generated video trained on his voice and his face. Um, and you could barely tell, like there was something a little off about the way that the mm -hmm. mouth moved, but you could barely tell. Mm -hmm. And then we had uh, Will Reynolds go on stage and talk about how maybe SEO did die this time. And I was like, oh my God, no, I'm gonna have a panic attack. <laughs> um, and he said like, well, survive by adapting, which is what SEO has always done and how mm -hmm. um, big changes in the industry have always left some people behind. So maybe SEO has died a little bit, a bunch of times. Um, mm -hmm. There was Tom, Tom Capper's talk about how far can the Serbs bend until they break was super interesting too. I don't know. It was an incredible set of talks. And I have to say that the vibes were unmatched. They were like unreal. Everybody was so nice. And yeah, it was a fantastic time. There's awesome. definitely a big recommendation. Go rewatch the talks online because they're so, so good. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Thanks for Brilliant. all the recommendations. I'm going to go back and watch this and write all the, all the stuff <laughs> from the books to the talks. Um, yeah, we're going to be knowledge packed for the rest of the year. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, yeah, had some really great answers from some questions as well. <laughs> and, thank you so uh, much for having me. And for the yeah, nice questions. I loved it. Rest <laughs> well now. I know you have a little bit jet lagged as well <laughs> from the traveling. But yeah, <laughs> no. Um, all right. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will be chatting soon. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Lydia. We'll chat. Yay. Thanks very much, Lydia. Have a great Bye. weekend. Thanks. You too.